the uh, Climate Council Science and Data Subcommittee meeting for May 12th. Um, first up is to go over the agenda. A um, couple of things on the agenda today. Uh, first, uh, just a short going over uh, the work plan, uh, really briefly where we are with that, about 15 minutes for that. Uh, then uh, we'll go into talking about the greenhouse gas inventory with uh, have a committee discussion and uh, Colin Smythe of DEC will um, help guide us through that um, as the, uh, the, the one doing a lot of the technical work behind the inventory. And, uh, and then we'll have a presentation with um, climate access and rise talking about the public outreach for the, the council and the climate action plan uh, with uh, a few things sprinkled within uh, including public comment um, on each individual section and, uh, and talking about the next meeting. Uh, does that, does anybody have any comments on the agenda or questions? Nope, looking good, TJ. Great, thank you, Leslie Ann. I do, I do wanna just note that um, we, we are uh, scheduled to go to four o'clock today, uh, a bit, bit longer. Hopefully we can move things along and, um, you know, if it, if it works out, maybe there'll be time for a break in between, but if not, we may just, uh, may just have to keep going for two and a half hours. Um, also in the first agenda item, I believe I had um, to approval of the minutes from April 28th. I know those were just sent out uh, yesterday morning. So if folks didn't have time to review, please let me know, we can, we can stay on that agenda item issue, or we can, uh, but if I don't hear objections, we could, uh, we could approve the minutes here. Any comments or questions on the agenda or on the minutes, I'm sorry. Okay, so we will consider those approved. Thank you. All right, so next up on the agenda, I believe is, uh, is the work plan. Um, I have just until 150 allocated for this. And so I, I sent out a few documents yesterday, um, as we discussed a couple of weeks ago, uh, they're more description of the key questions proposed. So we had the old work plan from the 20th of April is when it was last revised. And then we had a document that some folks saw, or actually I showed last time around and sent around at least a week ago, or maybe two weeks ago, uh, kind of framing up the key questions for each topic area for, uh, for a couple of the topics. So I've updated that to include the greenhouse gas inventory. So there's three of the topics gonna to have the subcommittee purpose uh, and goal for this topic item. And then it also shows, you know, what are the key questions under that topic item? How are we going to deal with those questions? And, you know, what's a general time frame for dealing with those? And the way I'm thinking about the work plan at this point in these key questions is just to kind of be a framing guide to make sure we tackle everything and to kind of keep us on track and what we might need to talk about in each subcommittee meeting. Um, so I, I want to point out that there are two topic items that were in the original work plan that we haven't, um, gotten into this document or into this format, I'm a little less concerned about the particular format than I am just making sure we have uh, questions identified and understanding how we're going to tackle them and, and a general time frame of when, um, and those, those two areas are the, our climate modeling and uh, and the human health impacts um, of climate change. Um, the, the, the last thing, and then I'll stop talking and let, let people react a little bit. Uh, the last thing that I'll point out is that uh, we haven't uh, gotten feedback from other committees on, on our work plan here. We 
um, we did, Jared did send out to the cross sector committee and we, we got a little bit of feedback on uh, kind of the carbon budget carb piece uh, within the greenhouse gas inventory um, from that committee. Uh, but we didn't get robust feedback on the whole thing or answering the question, what do you really need from us? Um, or even just saying, yes, what you have is what we need from you. So we didn't get that kind of feedback. And um, my idea for going forward is for the I'm liaisons. Oh yeah, go ahead. TJ, just to build on that, I did have a conversation with um, Rich Cowart, co-chair of the Cross-Sector Mitigation Committee, and we walked through the work plan and he said that it looked good to him in terms of what the Cross-Sector Mitigation Committee would be you know, hoping for in terms of support. So it wasn't a written response, but at least, you know, um, there was that additional response that it was, it was, there was an affirmative, yes, this, this looks good and helpful for our purposes of what we're planning, at least from, from Rich, not from the full committee, but that I thought that was valuable from him as co-chair. Yeah, thank you, Jared. Um, so <clears throat> uh, I'll, I'll make an ask on this part of it, uh, and then uh, I'll let other people talk, like I promised. Um, uh, it, that the liaisons that we identified for each committee take the take the work plan and uh, and and try and get feedback from uh, the other committees. Um, they don't respond. They don't respond, but and we'll. Uh, I, I guess we'll need to assume that, that that's okay, but uh, I'd like to try and get feedback as we go forward. That's not to say we'll address it you know, next week, but we'll, we'll try and incorporate into the plan of things we need to do as a committee. So does anybody have, um, have any comments on kind of the structure of those key questions or uh, or just the work planning in general? Uh, this, uh, TJ, I have, I've never been real clear about the human health piece of what we're trying to do um, and uh, human health and health impacts. I mean, at, at one level, at the, at the highest level, um, the human health impacts of climate change are gonna be the same in Vermont whether we choose to emphasize buildings or transportation or, or um, agriculture or, you know, regardless of which interventions we pick at a high level, the human health impacts are gonna be driven by the temperature change and the climate change that are global. And so, you know, it really doesn't matter very much what path we choose with respect to how to get our greenhouse gases down to the level we want them that's not going to have much health effect in Vermont. It's going to contribute to improving the health of the, of the people of the world, but it's not going to have much effect on us in Vermont. There are a couple of places in the margins where that's not so true. For example, uh, if we were, if, if the result of our, um, of our planning was to reduce the amount of um, wood burned in older, um, stoves and reduce indoor air pollution, then we could have some short-term health improvements. If the net effect of what we were doing was to actually increase the use of wood, uh, it might go the other way, depending on how people, how, how that's actually implemented. Um, th there aren't very many places like that, but there are a few. I mean, is that what we're supposed to be trying to address is those marginal uh, benefits or harms? So I think one way of answering that, Richard, is um, I had a conversation with Jared Ulmer yesterday um, to ask him if he would be able to, to bring some of those um, perspectives to our work group, and he would be happy to do so. Um, he's just a little bit strapped right now with a couple of things that he needs to get out the door deadline wise. But those human health, indoor air quality impacts are some of the things that we had started to talk a little bit about yesterday. So. Um, they're on the radar, they're pieces we need to flesh out. We're just probably not able to flesh them out today or in the next seven days. But I just wanted to respond to, to your concern of, of bringing those pieces um, to, to bear. Okay, but uh, just so we understand that 
the, the bulk of the human health impacts were, are not going to be affected one way or the other by what we do. But on the, but on the margins, there could be some. I suppose if, if we've succeeded in replacing all of our internal combustion vehicles with electric vehicles um, over, a, over a short interval, we might also have some improvements in human health from improved air quality in urban areas, particularly, uh, as I think about it. I mean, there, but, and it, if that's what we're supposed to address, we can do that. I just, I just wanted to be clear on that. I don't know who the person is whom you referred to who you said you were gonna get involved. Jared, so Jared is, is one of the Jared is one of the two members at the Department of Health who has that health climate uh, expertise. Um, Dr. David Grass is the other person. Um, both Jared and, and David have been invited by other subcommittees to participate. Uh, I think one of the challenges right now is that they're also helping to staff the, the COVID response. And yes. so to the extent that when some of that um, minimizes a little bit, they will have more. And one of the things that I brought up in Monday's um, steering committee slash subcommittee uh, co-chair meeting is that we may want to think about those concentric circles that we had talked about a few months ago in terms of helping to staff all of our subcommittees because folks like Jared and David who are uh, who have expertise and would like to participate but they they have other um, pressing responsibilities right now. Um, to the extent that we can open up mechanisms for them to bring their expertise to the table in a way that makes sense are, are one of the things that I think we need to sort of think about honestly in, in, in making sure we don't leave people behind. So I think as, as Jared and David are able to contribute, we'll be able to flesh out some of those um, health concerns or health um, thinking that we, we need to really sort of grapple with before we can actually put on paper. You know, apparently, I was apparently I was recruited to be on this subcommittee partly because I'm an epidemiologist, um, at least I used to be, um, and uh, if I, it's not clear to me yet how I can get engaged in that. But if you'll let me know, I will be glad to get engaged at that at that technical level with the health experts. Perfect. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, I think... I think I cut somebody else off. Was that you, TJ? It, it may have been, but um, what, what I was going to comment on is it would be, um, I think it, it would be helpful if we can get those key questions that we want to have answered kind of laid out. And, you know, in the original work plan, there it, it's not all that clear. There's some categories of things, but um, what what are the key questions? And uh, the other thing I was going to point out is that in the work plan, in the cost effectiveness analysis piece, um, there's a key question of what are the boundaries of where we're counting benefits and costs of um, climate change and of the mitigation measures and adaptation measures. And that gets a little bit to Richard's question of, well, do we care about, you know, the impacts broader than Vermont or just in Vermont. Um, and so there's a spot for that that initial, maybe that's more of a threshold question of, of uh, in order to better answer the health question of are, are we, um, are we, what are the boundaries by which we're doing our analysis? Um, and I don't want to answer that question right now because we don't have time for it. <laughs> yeah, uh, TJ, I, I, I don't want to perseverate too much, but that wasn't exactly the question I was asking or the point I was trying to make. It was that to the extent that we're gonna have um, changes in temperature and rainfall here and elsewhere uh, as a result of greenhouse gas emissions, the exact path by which we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions in Vermont isn't gonna affect that. I do like uh, Richard's example of Wood burning because that does uh, have a local effect, right? And I see our role as if the measure is to increase wood by X percentage, we should be able to <clears throat> incorporate the societal cost of that health uh, degradation, if you will. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, weatherization is another example of uh, reducing indoor air quality issues. Um, it, 
do folks have uh, other comments? Any other subcommittee members have, have comments on this? So I, I did send Jared a copy of our work plan yesterday after our discussion. So to the extent that he's able, he will be able to provide feedback on the key questions piece that you're asking about, TJ. Um, so I think uh, we, we'll have that. It's just not today. Right, so that, right, right. And, and I'm not expecting it today. So what I, uh, what I was thinking is that we would take those key questions and we have the work plan. Um, and if there are edits uh, from subcommittee members, please send them, send them to me and, and then we can, um, we can talk about changes um, at, at the next meeting if necessary. Um, you know, or, you know, just as we go, I, I, I'm, I mean, I, I'm trying to do this process because I, we need to start answering some of the questions we're asking. So I, I, I'm hoping that we can, A, have subcommittee members look at what was sent out yesterday. I know it was only a day before the meeting. And if there are comments or questions, send them to me and then we can um, we can have a little bit of time um, to talk about the work plan. Are we still on the right track at the next meeting? Um, or we could just, I could send those around. Maybe this is a better idea. I'll send those around to folks. And then if anybody has any issues with the edits, then we talk about them at the next meeting um, in order to allow us to have this work planning document moving forward, um, but also not to use you know, 80% of every meeting talking about the work planning. So, so I, I, I will say, sorry, I, I was gonna say a couple other um, sort of steps forward on the work plan that um, are sort of happening behind the scenes is Jay and I met as well to chit chat about the climate pieces. And we still have to flesh a lot of those out. So that's why you didn't get a lot of written feedback on that, but we are having those conversations. And then Jay, Lou, and I also chit chatted about some of the, the underlying infrastructural pieces that a lot of the solutions and, and mitigative strategies are gonna depend on. And so um, Lou and, and Jay spent some more time today working through some of those pieces. And, and I'm sure they're probably not ready for prime time as yet, but to the extent that Lou and Jay, if you wanted to say a couple words, Yeah, uh, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were talking more about the electric grid infrastructure and climate resilience there and, and changes that might need to happen there. Um, we had a pretty good conversation to summarize the where this work might intersect that. I guess the key high level takeaway is there's a lot of work that's already happening there with planning and, and thinking ahead because it has to in order to maintain reliability on the grid. So there might actually not be a lot of action or, or places where it needs to be elevated into to this work plan. Uh, there were a few key things related to cost benefit uh, investments and other places around resilience that we wanted to bring up. Um, Lou, did you want to add anything else to that? Yeah, I think that's a great characterization, Jay. Um, I think the, uh, the important points to take away are perhaps uh, a cost benefit of uh, in-state solar, um, something that will certainly be necessary to address as we you know, consider any potential recommendations for in-state generation. Um, and, and then I think there's, it's worth asking the question of utilities, um, what their perception is of the, the necessary steps to take around storm hardening and, and resilience in general. Um, I think that many of the other factors under consideration such as enabling technologies and um, actual infrastructure decisions um, given present information um, is, is being addressed sufficiently um, to the degree that it may not be necessary. Thank you. Thanks. And I, I um, as you have those discussions, I just want to caution, uh, you know, I think the in-state benefits, cost benefit in-state, out-of-state solar, that fits really well into all the modeling that we're doing. Adaptation and resilience, I am cautious of taking on um, work in the science and data committee that is it seems squarely in a different subcommittee uh, world and so we just need to 
ensure that it's only one of us doing it, not both committees. I, I to completely agree that it needs to be done, but I just don't want to this committee doing work that's being tackled in another committee also. Great. So I, I will uh, just in, uh, ask again uh, that subcommittee members who are the de designated last time liaisons with other committees just reach out and try and, uh, if you haven't already, um, to try and get feedback uh, from other committees so that we know up front whether we're missing anything or not. Any, any other comments on the work plan? Okay, hearing none, um, I think we started a little late, so I'm, I'm gonna just claim that we're on schedule here and um, transition to the greenhouse gas inventory and, and some of the key questions. And I, I just wanna invite um, Colin Smith to uh, turn on your video. Thank you, Colin. And um, you know, to the extent you are willing and able, lead us through, um, of a little bit on the inventory. Thanks, TJ. Um, yeah, I, I can certainly give kind of a, an overview on, on some of the inventory um, pieces. I, I have kind of just one slide on the general methodologies, but I'll, I'll go through that. And um, if there are any questions on kind of specifics, I'm, I'm certainly happy to, to talk about those. Um, so let me just try sharing my screen here if I can. Uh, see if that, all right, can everybody see that okay? All right. There we go. Okay, so apologies, there's kind of a lot on this slide. Um, but this is kind of just a, a very high level um, overview of how the emissions are calculated by sector for, for the greenhouse gas emissions inventory. Um, and I will also just note that uh, the, new, the newest iteration of the inventory, 1990 to 2017, uh, was just posted on our website yesterday. So that is now available. Um, and that goes into a little bit more depth than the previous reports um, do in terms of the methodologies for that. So maybe a good place um, to look for more information as well. Um, but let me, uh, let me dive in here and anybody can feel free to, uh, to interrupt me if, if you have questions or what. Um, I'll probably just kind of stop after, after each sector and see if anybody has questions as I go. Um, so I'm going to start off with, uh, with the transportation sector, and that's kind of uh, the big one, obviously, and the one that may take the longest to talk about. Um, so the thing about the transportation sector, um, the methodology was updated in this current inventory, uh, as you will see if you read it, and it has had some implications on kind of emissions from the sector as well as overall emissions from the state. Um, so I'm just gonna give you a little bit of, of background on that just so everybody is aware. So in the previous inventories, we had adopted a method um, for the years we could using uh, the National Emissions Inventory. And um, the National Emissions Inventory is a, a multi-pollutant inventory put together by EPA every three years, it's triennial. And um, <clears throat> we together at ANR in the air quality and climate division um, inputs for the model that they use to produce these emissions um, called the MOVES model, which many of you may be familiar with. And um, the MOVES model is, it's based on vehicle miles traveled, and um, but it's very granular in terms of all the inputs by county, by vehicle type, age distribution, all kinds of different factors that go into that. Um, and so we had deemed previously that, that having that granularity and that kind of very detailed information was kind of the, the better way to go um, in terms of estimating emissions from the sector. 
Um, but those were only available from 2011 onward. And so before 2011, we had been using emissions that were generated previously um, by or for the governor's report that came out in 2007 that a lot of our methodologies are kind of based on. Um, <clears throat> so, so the NEI values um, from 2011 onward only come out every three years. And so we had been scaling those based on changes, percent changes in fuel sales and vehicle miles traveled. Um, and so the reason for the switch was when, when I looked at the 2017 values for the NEI, um, they were way lower than I was expecting them to be. Um, and then I had projected based on the fuel sales and VMT changes. And, um, and when EPA puts these together, they kind of use a combination of data that we provide um, for all the detailed inputs, VMT, vehicle fleet, and they kind of couple that with information of their own that they supply to kind of keep it consistent, consistent across all the states. Um, and so it, it was difficult. It was kind of, I wasn't able to determine why the emissions were so much lower than I thought they should have been. And I reached out to EPA and had some back and forth and, and, um, we weren't able to figure it out. And I did multiple moves runs myself to try to determine the you know, sensitivities, what could have been affecting this. And I, I wasn't able to determine why emissions would drop, emissions drop like 7% with a 5% increase in vehicle miles traveled between the two years, between 2014 and 2017. Um, and so I, I just didn't have a lot of confidence in that 2017 number and, um, so decided to look into the fuel-based um, methodology, which is actually the methodology that the IPCC, you know, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, recommends. Um, and so not being able to reconcile that difference and kind of knowing that the IPCC recommended the other methodology and Massachusetts also uses that methodology, we decided to to go ahead and go forward with that methodology, even though it does have some some uh, fairly significant kind of shows significantly lower levels from the transportation sector. So, um, sorry that was a little bit long, but I feel like that's kind of an important thing for everybody to to understand as this new inventory comes out. Um, so, so now for the methodology. Um, it is based on an EPA state inventory tool module um, for the on-road, or actually for both the on-road and non-road portion of it. Um, and it's just based on fuel sales data. Um, there are also a, there's also a component to the, um, to the mobile sources piece for methane and nitrous oxide that's calculated with a separate EPA tool um, because those two gases are, are dependent on the different engine technologies. And so that tool is actually based on similar information to the EPA moves model, but that tool is, is much less sophisticated than the moves model is. Um, and the nitrous oxide and methane is a, is a very small fraction of the total emissions from the transportation sector. Um, yeah, so I, that was a lot and very fast, but, um, but anybody have any, any questions or comments on that? Colin, Colin uh, it's, it's Richard. Um, I just have a very high level comment that applies probably to all the different pieces. And I'm not looking for a long answer here, but um, almost everywhere you've relied on the EPA state inventory tool, the SIT tool, um, which in turn, I believe is an effort to implement the IPCC recommendations at a national level. Um, are there any places where you think that the SIT approach is vulnerable to criticism and perhaps we ought not to be following it or at least consider not following it? Hmm. Um, that's, that's a tough one. I, there are a couple of places where we don't use the SIT tool. Electricity, the electricity sector is one of those. 
Um, and that I honestly don't, I've never used the SIT tool for the electricity sector. Um, they have now updated it to allow the same, I think, um, the same kind of consumption type methodology that we use, but that didn't used to be the case. It used to be only in-state generation, which is why we never used it. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that question, Richard, um, in terms of other methodologies. Um, a lot of the SIT tools, as I think you probably know, are, are pretty in-depth and, um, and are, are pretty complicated. Um, and I, there are certainly other ways to do that, but I, I haven't delved into those generally. Um, but electricity is the one I'll kind of call out specifically. Okay, thanks. I appreciate it. Sure. Jared, did you have your hand up? Yeah, thanks, TJ. And thanks for the um, presentation and overview, Colin. I just wanted to offer a comment. Um, and, and that is that, like, just starting at base principles, I think a couple of the things that most of us agree we want to keep in mind is the importance of transparency and accuracy uh, in terms of uh, getting at our emissions inventory estimates. And from that perspective, given the background research I've done and what I know now, I think that this is a, is a, is a real improvement. Um, I think that a, a, a model for estimating transportation emissions that's primarily based on BMT has a number of pitfalls. I mean, one is we know the inputs and the outputs of that moves model, but we don't know, we can't see the assumptions and what's going on inside it. It's kind of a black box. Um, and if you just think about how VMT is collected, it's a pretty complex um, calculation where an error in an initial estimate can get magnified as you try to extrapolate that to the entire state. So, you know, folks, you'll will see those kind of, you know, black mats across a roadway designed to track how many times a vehicle is going over it gets multiplied by road length sometimes interns are hired or other people are hired to you know sit stand at an intersection and do traffic counts but then all of that gets added up and in, into a statewide number it's not we don't have a direct count of vmt and i think there's a potential for a lot of error in those numbers the benefit of the fuel sales based or the fuel consumption based method is we have numbers of all the fuels that are sold in the state of vermont that have to get reported uh, to the tax department, and then also for numbers that are that are non-taxed. So for me, if given what I know now, I would say I have a lot more confidence in the accuracy of estimating transportation emissions from fuel sales because it's it's a direct, comprehensive count. It's not a model built on top of a model. Um, you know, I do think that there, you know, are some issues that we should be aware of in terms of the fuel-based estimate, in terms of you know, how large is the effect of the, the border effect with New Hampshire, how many Vermonters are actually going and buying fuel in New Hampshire because of the lower sales tax than in Vermont. But um, setting that aside, I, based on my review, and I'm just one voice here, I would just say that this is, to me, consistent with an in-boundary inventory and provides greater transparency and accuracy than we likely had before with a VMT-based model. Great, thank you very much, Jared. Um, yeah, I, I probably sh should have should have mentioned that as well, but um, yeah, I appreciate you adding that on. And yeah, it's it is. I mean, VMT I feel like is is an important indicator, certainly, of emissions in the state, but it is it is a much more kind of a complex calculation modeled number than the fuel sales number is. And so I think I would tend to agree with you. Um, it, I, as I've talked to you about before, I kind of the reason that we had gone with the moves model is that it does provide so much more granularity in terms of where those emissions are coming from, which is important information. But, um, but I think in terms of just total accuracy, I think you're right. And, um, and I have in the, in the 2017 report, um, at least tried to retain a little bit of that detail just in terms of, it doesn't apply specifically anymore to the values because they're calculated in a different way, 
but just as an overall kind of indicator of where those emissions are, I've included some of that NEI kind of granularity in there just to give an idea of the of the sources. Um, so yeah, um, that's I guess I'll leave the transportation sector there unless anybody's got any other questions on it, or we can always come back at the end too if you want to do that. Um, all right, uh, moving on, um, I'll go next to the residential, commercial, industrial fuel use sector, which covers, it's, it's mainly buildings, kind of heating buildings, heating water, cooking, that sort of thing. Um, and that is actually completed, emissions estimates from that are completed actually with the same tool as the transportation sector now, at least the majority of them. Um, and that's called the CO2 FFC, the carbon dioxide from fossil fuel combustion tool. And it's, it is essentially based on the same, the same thing, it's fuel sales. Um, but that one is based off of the um, Energy Information Administration state energy data set, the SEDS data that I'm sure most of you have heard, heard about. Um, and those are kind of they're based on kind of EIA's, say, calculations, but there a lot of it is reported kind of data that they compile and, and subdivide into different sectors. And so that, that's a data set that's used by lots of different people, a big federal data set. Um, and so it certainly could have issues, but it's, it's a very commonly used data set um, that, that lots of different models use. And so that's, that's the best data we have for, uh, for that sector. Um, yeah, there's, there's not a whole lot more on that one. Um, it, it does, the, the tool itself does get a little bit more complex in terms of kind of the different the different fuels being used and kind of a breakout into commercial, industrial and residential fuels. Um, but, but it is mostly based on, on those, that fuel data. Um, and we do, I will know, we do supplement that with, um, with wood use data from the, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mess the name up, but the residential fuel assessment, I believe, um, put out by Forks Parks and Recreation. It's a survey that, I'm not sure exactly how often it comes out. I believe there was one in 2014 and the most recent one I think is 2019. So I think it varies a little bit on the timeline, but, um, but it's got some useful data in there and we, we try to adjust those numbers um, based on that. But I will also note as I think a topic that, that Richard brought up or has certainly brought up in his questions before that um, the carbon dioxide from that wood burning is currently considered zero emission, it's considered carbon neutral, um, which is just kind of an important point to flag, but we do consider the methane and nitrous oxide from, from those, from the wood combustion. Um, all right, I, I'm gonna stop there then and see if there's any questions on the, the RCI sector. Thanks, Colin. I'll just um, point out too that in the list of questions on the greenhouse gas inventory, this is high, that in particular, along with other fuel sources, we'll get into, you know, particularly in the electric sector, that one of the key questions is, I think, for our subcommittee to tackle is um, should we continue doing that? Um, it, 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 with your biomass example there. Uh, and, and some of the other fuels. So I think there's more to come. The proposed process is to get recommendations from our technical consultant and then, and then um, talk about those recommendations in the subcommittee. Um, so um, I, I just wanted to throw that out there uh, for, for everybody. Sure. Yeah, that's great. And I'm happy to, to kind of touch on that um, issue as well. If, if people want to discuss that a little bit, just in terms of Kind of how we view it in the inventory, and yeah, some of the some of the potential issues with that because um, it's definitely interesting and not incredibly straightforward answer. I think so. <laughs> um, uh, before you go on, uh, it looks like uh, I don't know if you can see folks' hands, Colin. So Richard has his oh, hand yes. up. Yeah, yeah. I just um, I worry about motivated reasoning. 
uh, with respect to the biomass. You know, the, the 2016 Comprehensive Energy Plan um, that we're about to try to replace um, does the same thing. That is, it treats wood burned for home heat as having zero carbon dioxide production. And that makes, um, and it, the wood the wood burning is is very important to the balancing of the of the different fuel sources and um, and their carbon dioxide impact, especially you know five to ten years into the, the comprehensive energy plan, um, and I do, we just need to be alert to the possibility that uh, our reasoning about how to treat. Uh, wood combustion is influenced by our concern about the consequences of, of, of making various choices on our, on our, on the ability of our, you know, on, on, on how simple it is to write a plan or how direct it is to write a plan. Um, you know, it, we, it's really easy to let your, your judgment be influenced by what you know are the consequences of your decision. Thanks, Richard. I, I does that, any subcommittee members want to respond to that? I think I think that's an important important point. And, uh, hearing none, I don't think I can see everybody's hands either. But hearing none, I'll, I'll just say I think that it, it is where a technical consultant who may not have. Um, you know, the uh, embedded, um, for lack of a better word, I'm going to say baggage that comes along from being like a, a stakeholder on the council or a committee member or, a, uh, you know, depending on how invested they are in, Ver in Vermont, but just having an independent voice come in and make a recommendation will at least have a tr transparent view of that and understand if we are making that decision out of convenience, it'll be fully transparent through this process. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and we'll better understand the consequences, I think. Thank you, TJ. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll, since, since we kind of have started down the road, I'll at least just chime in quickly that, yeah, I think it, it's a pretty in-depth question in, and I'm, in my mind, at least, it gets into part of it is the time scale component of it, which I think kind of relates to the global warming potential 20 versus 100 year question that I think we're going to get into. Um, but and so it's kind of whether whether you want to prioritize kind of the short term, in which case it might it's, it's not going to be as effective because that carbon dioxide is just going to be emitted when you burn that material versus if you're talking about a little bit longer time frame when that has a chance to be re-sequestered with kind of management, proper management practices, et cetera. So yeah, it's, it's a tough question. And, and it also gets into the whole issue of gross versus net with right now it's that those emissions are theoretically captured in the land use sector um, by land use change kind of in the forestry but whether or not the data is granular enough to capture that I don't know I I tend to have my doubts on that but I'm, I'm not really an expert in that field so I would like to hear from others on that I think but anyway that's it's it's not a straightforward question I guess so yeah it would be interested to hear the, the kind of consultant view on that as well. Um, sorry, go ahead, TJ. Oh, I was just gonna say about, uh, we have about 15 more minutes allocated, Colin. Yep, all right, I'll, I'll start cruising through it, thanks. <laughs> um, all right, so we've got a couple more um, kind of hefty sectors, but I'll, I'll go through them at least at least briefly, and if we have time, we can we can delve into them a little bit. Um, so the agricultural sector is next. Um, that one is um, 
right now it's all based on the EPA state inventory tool. And uh, Richard, I think you've had a few questions about that as well. Um, I will say on that, it's uh, the vast majority of the of the emissions in that sector are based on animal populations um, and tariff fermentation and manure management. Um, and so that is all kind of default data from the USDA in there on those animal populations. Um, and those have different emission factors applied, et cetera. Um, so I, I won't go into the super details, but I will say that um, right now, and I have a meeting with them on Friday, actually, um, the Agency of Agriculture Force, um, or butcher their name, and, and markets is, um, is looking at that tool and kind of coming up with some um, with some recommendations and potential different options for calculating emissions from that sector. Um, and I know that the Ag and Ecosystems group is gonna be interested in that as well. And so I think there will be a lot of, a lot of thought and work going into this sector um, moving forward. So I, I'm not an expert in the agricultural sector. So I'm, I'm definitely happy to hear that, that input from those folks. Um, so I think I'm gonna leave that there unless there are any questions on. Richard, you have? Not, not a question, but I think the, um, the, the Ag and Ecosystem Subcommittee particularly interested in hearing about some of the ways in which things like you just mentioned, um, call it enteric fermentation are actually handled. So that when you, you think about bringing um, parts of the methane pieces in there, they would be particularly interested in, in sort of diving under the hood a little bit. And once mm -hmm. they have a, a better sense of that, then they'll be able to actually pose questions, which we could then bring into our work plan. So to the extent some of those conversations are moving forward, really happy to hear that. Okay, great. Uh, if I could, I just want, this is Richard again. Um, smart, honest people have disagreed about the best way to do this. Um, and uh, it's methane is is a short lived in the in the atmosphere compared to carbon dioxide, and so that has a bunch of implications. Um, Colin helped me find a chart in one of the IPCC documents that I interpret as showing that in the first hour of a methane release. Uh, when, when it's at full potency, it's about 120 times as potent as carbon dioxide in trapping heat. Um, we use 100 years, we say, well, what's this, how much heat is it going to trap over 100 years compared to a comparable amount of CO2? And that's where we get those values in the, around 30. And then if you, if you pick a, a shorter time interval, you get a higher value. And this is so, you know, some environmental activists have urged us to use a 20 year uh, time horizon for the, the, uh, the warming potential of, uh, of, of methane. That on the other side, people in the on the agricultural community have been advocating for a very different approach to how to assess the global warming potential of methane and are proposing a, a, a method, which as far as I can tell would lead to using a value of about four. Um, and uh, so, you know, we're anywhere from, from four to 120 or 84. And whatever value we choose, um, you know, it, it's, it, we could choose to follow authority. We could follow EPA's lead. We could follow IPCC's lead. But if we do that, we need to have a clear understanding of why we're doing that. And if we're adopting an alternative approach something like the GWP star approach to assessing the, the global warming impact of methane, then we should have a clear understanding of why we're adopting an alternative. And it shouldn't be because we like or don't like the answer that it leads us to. Yeah, thanks for that, Richard. And, and I, I'm just gonna point out something that everybody probably knows, but the challenges of, um, the council and, and this committee needing to make a recommendation on uh, really important things like that. And uh, for example, the cross-sector committee needing to come up with policies before we've made that recommendation. Uh, and those policies 
um, may really change depending on the result. You just gave a really wide range of, of methane emissions, potential, uh, you know, counting impacts. And so um, I, as of now, I'm not sure there's anything we can do about that. I just, um, I feel like it's important that we um, acknowledge that, that issue with, um, with the process here. I'll just offer TJ, if it's okay, briefly, that I think that, you know, we, we've said before in this committee that, you know, a guiding principle for us is, is following the latest and best available science. And that usually is sufficient, but on areas of emerging science where there's a lot of complexity and not quite yet agreement and unanimity, to me, the, the approach on questions like the ones that Richard is answering is, we just have to do our very careful due diligence, especially once we've selected a technical consultant to, to work with us to gather the data about how, you know, exactly the questions that were laid out in the work plan. How is IPCC looking at this? How is EPA? How are some of the states that are taking a different approach that have a rationale for it, like New York in terms of using a GWP20 uh, timescale for, for methane emissions? How are they doing that? Why are they doing that? So that we can just know the full range of options and and be able to show our work on why one would be preferable from kind of a scientific defensibility standpoint or if there really are options where it's you know it, it comes down you could go either way based on the, the latest and best available science being able to explain why we think one is preferable to, to me it's like some of these things are not easy answers and so we just have to do our work to, to collect as much information as possible, show our work, show our assumptions, and not say, this is the one right way, say, this is where we've landed for now and here's why, but there's other approaches or we need to keep tracking this or consider this as well. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that, Jared. All right, sorry, Colin, I just took up more, more of your time here. Well, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Good, interesting discussion. Um, yeah, I, I would agree. I don't, I think there aren't any easy answers and maybe not even any right answers. It uh, kind of, in my mind, depends on what, what the priority is and kind of so many unknowns that it's hard to know if there is a right answer, just like, like the time scale question piece of it. Um, but I'll leave that there for now and, and move on. Um, industrial processes sector. Um, so this sector is based on a few different methodologies. Um, the first one that I'll touch on is, is another EPA state inventory tool. Um, that's for a few different sectors, um, but most of them are very small contributors. So I'm not gonna go into them now. They're listed in the report if you want to know more. Um, but a lot of that kind of production related emissions is not happening in Vermont. Um, so kind of the two main portions of this sector are from the ozone depleting substances substitutes or ODS substitutes. Um, and those are HFCs that are used um, in generally as refrigerants or in kind of aerosol applications, things like that. And um, the, other, the other main component is the semiconductor manufacturing piece of the inventory. And um, that is uh, a few different, uh, they call them F gases, fluorinated gases, components in that. Um, so for the semiconductor manufacturing methodology, um, it's probably no secret that uh, Global Foundries is kind of our, our one source there. And they have had to report data to EPA since 2011, um, and so we've I've just incorporated that data into the into the inventory there, um, and and I know that well I haven't been party to them, but I've heard that we are having kind of discussions with them on potential ways for them to they're they're already taking steps to kind of see what they can do, but um, to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. But their processes are very technical, obviously, and. And I think it's not necessarily an easy lift, but I think it's my understanding that they've already taken steps and are, are willing to keep engaging on that. 
Um, side note there, but um, for the historical data pre-2011, I have taken that um, 2011 data and just projected it backwards using, um, using kind of the national emissions curve um, because that's kind of the, the best data I have available at the moment to do that. Um, for the ODS substitutes, I am currently using a tool that was created by California for, um, for the US Climate Alliance. And um, that is based on kind of some in-depth research and analysis that California has done and, and their FGAS model. And um, it kind of is, is based on a per capita value that is applied to Vermont, but can be also kind of tailored based on the percentage of households with air conditioning or heat pumps and things like that. Um, and so that's, that's, I think, a better tool. I guess there's one uh, difference for you, I guess, Richard. Um, I think that is a better tool than the EPA SIT currently is for that sector. Um, and so we've adopted that kind of as, as being involved in that climate alliance process. Um, so I think I'm gonna leave that one there unless there, unless there are any questions on those. All right, well then let me, let me move on here. Um, I guess I'm gonna get into, well, why don't I do this? I'm gonna skip down to waste first because I think electricity might, might take up the rest of our time if we, if we start on that one now. So um, jump down to the waste sector and, um, and say that the, the waste sector is done with both an EPA state inventory tool for the wastewater sector. Um, and that is mostly based on kind of default data that's in that tool. Um, I have updated kind of the, the percentage of households on septic value from, uh, from the wastewater section, a report, but, um, but that is also currently being reviewed um, by, by the wastewater folks. And so that may be updated in the future as well with some, at least with some different values and potentially trying to incorporate um, some, other, some other data into there. Um, the solid waste component is currently done. And this is again, another difference from the EPA SIT tool. Um, we, since we only have one active landfill in Vermont and kind of our two biggest landfills, which would be Coventry and, and Moortown, Moortown is closed, but they both have landfill gas to energy systems. And so in the air quality and climate division, we, um, or department, we, we get data reported to us on the amount of landfill gas that comes through those engines every year. And so we're able to use that reported gas total and then kind of an assumed fugitive rate based on that total to come up with emissions from the solid waste sector. Um, and we may, we may look a little bit at some of those calculations, but it sounds like those are, those are pretty good um, in running those by our solid waste folks. So they may have a few suggestions, but seemed okay with the methodology overall. Um, yeah, and I guess my, my last kind of piece on that is that the part of the reason that that number is so small, the waste sector is because again, we get back to the issue of carbon dioxide being biogenic. And so most of so the landfill gas is generated based on the decomposition of bio, biogenic materials. And when that gas is captured and combusted, that is converted to carbon dioxide. And um, per IPCC protocols, the CO2 from that combustion should not be counted in that sector. It will be captured in the land use sector. And again, that gets into a little bit of that kind of sticky accounting situation, but that is, that's currently how, how the inventory handles that, um, which, which is consistent with kind of other inventory protocols. Um, any, any questions on the waste sector before I move on? All right, um, I'll go jump next to the fossil fuel industry. Um, and that, that sounds like it should be a very large component. Um, it is actually a very small component of the inventory because 
the vast majority of the fossil fuels in the state are accounted for in all of these other sectors, um, namely transportation and the residential, commercial, industrial. So the fossil fuel industry portion is, it really just accounts for the um, leaks of natural gas in the transmission and distribution pipeline systems. Um, and so that's all, they're essentially state inventory dual methodologies, but it really just takes kind of the length of pipeline in the state um, and multiplies it by an emission factor depending on the pipeline type or service type, service line type. Um, so yeah, that that's a, a pretty quick quick one. But um, Richard, I see you've got a question on that one. You're on mute, Sorry, Richard. You're, you're muted. You all have probably read what I wrote about this, but I just want to reemphasize that some people think that we ought to count all of the fugitive emissions from natural gas extraction and transmission, not just those that happen in state. I, I think that's an interesting point. Um, and I, I think this can get into a whole nother discussion that we might have later on. I, to me, that would be more of a life cycle type of analysis, which, which I think is probably a good idea for decision making purposes, but but I'm not sure how it I'm not sure and feel free to, to chime in if you like Richard, but I'm not sure how it exactly fits with the other calculation yeah. methodologies. It, it seems to me that it would be directly analogous to our counting the carbon dioxide emissions from coal burning or fuel oil burning electricity generation where we import the electricity and we do in fact count, account for the carbon production from the electricity that we import from elsewhere. So this seems to me to be a direct analog. So, okay, I might have to think on that one a little yeah. bit. Yeah, we're not gonna settle it right now. I just- Okay, I fair just... enough. <laughs> um, great, any, any other questions on the, on the fossil fuel industry piece? Okay, well, uh, let, let me jump to the electricity sector then. And um, I think, this can either be fairly short and sweet, or we can get into uh, a pretty in-depth discussion on this, depending on where people want to go. But um, so the the electricity sector, the emissions, uh, as as Richard just mentioned, they're kind of our only uh, call it consumption-based um, piece of this inventory, and it's not strictly, at least with my understanding of a consumption-based inventory, it's not strictly a consumption-based inventory, but it does account for emissions of electricity used by Vermonters that is generated out of state. Um, and so, as Richard was just kind of alluding to, it would account for the carbon dioxide from the combustion of natural gas to generate the electricity that we, that we purchase in Vermont. Um, I guess, I guess my, my thought there is that it would not account for the upstream emissions prior to that natural gas being combusted out of state. And I think that maybe is where it gets a little bit trickier. Um, but again, that's, that's for another day, I think. So, um, so our methodology, um, which we, we developed with uh, public service, actually, before I started, um, is, is based on the own load, it's called own load data, which is kind of a, it's a, a list of purchase decisions, megawatt hours purchase decisions by the utilities, by the electricity generation type. And um, so we take that data, which, which is adjusted for um, RECs, uh, which is another topic of discussion that we will probably not have time to get into too much today, but um, currently is adjusted for, for rec retirements. And um, we take those kilowatt hour, megawatt hour values by generation type and multiply them by um, emission factors from, um, it's called ISO New England, the Independent Systems Operator New England. And um, they have kind of as, as a component of their residual mix, they have emission factors by generation source. And those are the emission factors that we apply to those kilowatt hours to come up with our, with our total. Um, and so 
I think I'll high level leave it there for electricity and see where, where folks might want to go with that. If anywhere. <laughs> well, thanks, Colin. This, this was a perfect high level uh, review of kind of the methodology for each sector. And I think as we started to get into with a couple of sectors, there's going to be a lot more to come here. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so I, um, before, before we um, let Colin go, <laughs> I, although I know you like to stick around for, for the, these committee meetings, um, uh, next on the agenda is to open it up for public comment on, on um, what we've just heard here uh, on both the inventory methods and, the, and or the work plan, if uh, folks have comments on that. And um, I will ask to just to please at this time, there'll, there'll be another opportunity for public comment at the end. So if keep the comments focused on inventory or the work plan as opposed to um, other topics that we might wanna uh, address. And I know the work plan is really broad, so maybe that doesn't limit it at all, but. Um, so I see uh, George Gross, your hand is up. I think you may be on mute. Uh, at least I can't hear you. Actually, it doesn't look like you're on mute, but I can't hear you. Could, could anybody else hear George or? What? You know, still nothing. Why don't, why don't we go to um, Carl Carl Bayer, um, and George will give you uh, give you another shot to come back around. Um, Carl, hi. You can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear okay. you. Thank you. Well, I'll say it, I'll say this again. I've said it before well, I'll say it, I'll say that we really should be counting um, the green gas gases that before they kept into Vermont from natural gas, fuel, oil, kerosene, uh, that should be part of our thinking about what to do about those fuels. And in terms of the discussion about wood heat, um, I really think we need to take a, a, a look at the, our, our wood heat use in the future. I personally see wood heat as a transition fuel at least until 2050, but I really wanna know if that's, if that's the way it should be. And one of the ways to do that is to have some data that tells us um, what CO2 is going to be coming from our uh, our wood heat, uh, our thermal use of wood heat, and including the fact that we want to move to advanced wood heating. I have an advanced wood heating system myself now, and um, I can tell you I haven't had a nosebleed in two years. I also believe uh, that I don't want to keep my neighbors who have older uh, furnaces and haven't uh, transitioned to an AWH uh, from having wood to heat their homes. So we need to know how much CO2 greenhouse gases we're going to be producing with our wood heat over the years. And we need to compare that to what would happen if we just stuck to fossil fuels. I mean, wood heat is at least a renewable within let's say 80 to 100 years fuel as opposed to the fossil fuels. And it's gonna help people like me know what I should be doing with my woods. Should I still be allowing people uh, to uh, use old furnaces like I used to use for 50 years? So I think that's a very important question. We need the data to tell us, compare the future of wood heat in Vermont for the next 30, 40 years compared to the continued use of natural gas, fossil fuel oil, and kerosene. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carl. Um, and, and again, hopeful that our, our technical consultant can start to address some of that as well um, in the real understanding the impacts uh, of, 
of wood and allowing us to make those decisions uh, or recommendations, I should say, uh, in this committee. Um, George, uh, do you want to try again? I'll say, do you hear me this time? Yeah, yes. Yes. Excellent. All right. Yeah, I found a rather obscure audio setting in my uh, Linux machine here. Uh, I had several uh, observations about the um, transportation related emissions. It seemed to me like uh, there's an overlooked opportunity to acquire the vehicle miles travel data from all the vehicles that are registered in Vermont. Uh, we do an annual or biannual state inspection process. And it seems reasonable that you could collect odometer readings at that point, the vehicle model, uh, you know, what year of model it was, so you know what the EPA rated fuel economy was. And aggregate that data, obviously, into a profile of uh, vehicle miles traveled for each type of vehicle and the age of the vehicles. This would give you a lot of insight into how rapidly you could hope to see vehicles retire and also identify who has what uh, energy pigs that are out there that would be first ones to choose to have an um, incentive of some kind to move over to something else. Um, the other comment I had is if we do, in fact, succeed in getting a large number of electric vehicles deployed over the next, say, five to 20 years, um, we need to think about, I think, a way to monitor the electrical use that's incurred and the indirect emissions associated with the electrical use for those vehicles. Um, and the only way I can think of to do that, looking at my own EV or plug-in hybrid uh, setup, is to add a meter that is um, a separate one independent of the rest of the house. So looking at the future when you're installing new charging stations or uh, household upgrades for the garage, uh, it would be useful to have a sort of something on the checklist to be eligible for a rebate, uh, some kind of a metering gadget that uh, perhaps the utility is able to look at and report simply a um, usage, but not a billable uh, usage on the uh, utility bill. I happen to do that by collecting it by hand, you know, looking at the um, statistics my car gives me, but it's um, a little more record keeping than most people would be willing to be bothered with. I think that's, that's my comment there. Thank you for those, George. I, I think that this both seem to get to the, one of the key questions of our committee of, you know, what data do we need to collect to inform our decisions forward that we may not already have, right? Or whether we have it or not. Um, and how useful will that uh, be? On the, um, on the electric sector, I know we, we do have um, the total electric sales data, right? From vehicles and other. Um, and in a lot of cases, when utilities are uh, providing incentives for either chargers or just vehicles, they're, they're, they are installing a charger and getting that on a different rate, which has a couple of benefits. One, it's separately metered uh, to know the sales. And two, we, um, that rate often encourages usage at, at at times where it keeps rates down for all rate payers. So, and um, in, in on the VMT, I, I've heard that thought around before, but I, I'm, I'm not sure what the barrier is there, but um, I think it's something to consider. So, um, thank you for those comments. Um, Jared, did, it looks like you want to maybe wanted to respond. Yeah, just a, a, a quick response. And thank you, George, for um, bringing up the, you know, the question of what additional data we could um, get from the Department of Motor Vehicles, especially with the kind of electronic annual inspections now with odometer readings. I would just say, and I, and this is not to you, George, because I assume that you know this, but just to make sure that everybody on this committee and on this call is, is aware, um, is that, that that question in some ways gets to the fundamental difference between an in boundary or territorial inventory that 
Vermont currently uses and every other state and country uses versus a, a consumption-based inventory because what, what that VMT count would, would be would just be for Vermonters vehicle miles traveled and it would include miles traveled by Vermonters out of state. Um, our current inventory is really looking at the emissions that occur within Vermont's borders, not just by Vermont drivers. So uh, I think Ken Jones is on the call and he could speak you know, more accurately to, to this than I could, but I believe uh, a citation from him was in the latest uh, transportation energy profile. And there was an estimate that um, some, somewhere around a quarter, I can't remember if it was fuel sales or vehicle miles traveled or estimated in Vermont or estimated to be by out of staters. And so I would just note that in the current inventory, what we're trying to estimate is transportation and Colin, please, you're the real expert here. Uh, but my understanding is that for consistency's sake and to avoid double counting, what we're trying to arrive at is an estimate of the emissions that occur from transportation activities that happen within Vermont, which is somewhat different than the emissions caused by Vermonters transportation, because some of Vermonters transportation is out of state and some of the emissions that occur within Vermont are not the result of Vermonters travel. And yeah, could I uh, respond to that comment, Jared? Um, I, I can see how that would muddy the waters when you have folks coming in from out of state. That definitely changes the fuel consumption tallies. Uh, where I guess you have to decide is, is if you're designing policy to minimize greenhouse gas emissions by Vermonters, uh, and that you really can't control the outcome for the out of state uh, visitors to Vermont. Uh, that's kind of dependent on the other states that have their respective policies to do the same as we're doing. Um, so it, it seems like the, the metric you would want to be tracking is the one that one you can control the outcome for. Yeah, thank you, George. And I, I think we are going to get into in a in a um, hopefully soon meeting is to talk about uh, what what other states are doing. So how does the inventory Colin just presented compare to what other states are doing in terms of methodology? Um, and, and that can help inform your question there as well or your comment. Thank you. Um, so uh, quickly, I guess, Colin, I think we can, oh, great. I was just going to ask if you could Pull your screen down, thank you. Um, all right, so two more comments. I do wanna to get to um, uh, our consultants public engagement and, and before I know at least one other subcommittee member has to leave and I wanna talk about the next meeting before before we get to that. But um, Mark, Mark Whitworth, please. Yeah, thanks TJ. Um, yeah. If, I, I'm interested in what Jared just said about being uh, accounting for the emissions that Vermonters are responsible for. And if we're serious about that, then we really need to look into all of the goods and services that are imported into Vermont. And we might want to uh, uh, subtract all of the emissions associated with goods and services that we export from Vermont. But you know, I have a feeling that the, uh, the emissions that we are responsible for by importing goods and services is probably a lot bigger than uh, <laughs> what we cause by driving around. Um, I also wanted to comment on the, uh, um, the remark that uh, Richard made about the health impacts uh, of, of wood. And he gave an example of a of health impacts that may come, or come about because of the um, recommendations included in the climate plan. And I want to point out that many people attribute negative health impacts to utility scale wind turbine operations. Uh, and the Northeast Kingdom Development Association looked into this seven or eight years ago with the help of David Grass, who uh, uh, Leslie Ann mentioned a little while ago. 
Um, and a fair amount of research has been performed since since then. And uh, you know, that's that's available. I I, I can try to uh, get references and pass them on to you. And I want to point out that other states have uh, shut turbines down or restricted their operation due to health concerns. So, um, and in, in fact, in Vermont, there are families that have abandoned their homes because of uh, turbine operations. So that's something that needs to be considered in uh, developing recommendations. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you for those comments, Mark. I, I will note that I, I think in part because of the comments you've made throughout the subcommittee meeting, one of the one of the key questions that is in the inventory uh, item here that we sent around is um, what type of data is needed for each type of inventory, like a consumption, production, or life cycle. And I think it may, it may not be explicit there, but I, when I write that, I'm informed by your comments of, um, uh, you know, should we be accounting for um, for products, for instance, as, as you suggest, or uh, previously, you, you know, consumption of meat or whatever it is. Um, and so I think that's a, that's a question, how would, and how would it be used and, and should we supplement our current methodology or revise it to, to incorporate this kind of analysis? And that's absolutely something we have to address here. So thank you and thank you for uh, continuing to bring that up. Um, uh, and also, I don't want to ignore your other comment on the health impacts. I, I think that's, you know, all, all measures, we, it can't just be the health impacts of one type of um, technology. We have to apply the same metric evenly. Um, I thought I saw one more hand up um, from Steve, but I, I don't see it anymore. That might have been an old hand from George. Um, okay, I, I think Steve Crowley just disappeared, but um, well, he'll have another chance if he comes back at the end of the meeting. Um, so before we we go on to our uh, to um, our public uh, engagement and outreach uh, consultants, I want to take a minute to talk about the next meeting in case. Any subcommittee members have to drop off, and I know Jay has already had to drop off. But um, I, I know this is a longer meeting today, um, and I actually, I personally like it because I feel like we're getting some more substantive and moving forward on some things. Um, but I, I guess I want to open it to subcommittee members about the um, timing and frequency of these meetings. Are longer meetings useful do folks agree with me uh, and uh, and then the frequency it, I'll, I'll even just throw out a suggestion there is I think longer every two weeks is is more productive but uh, I can see arguments the other way so open floor Julie I can't I get my button sorry <laughs> 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 I, I tend to agree, TJ. I think we may need to consider as we start to potentially get work products back from the, the technical consultants um, and just whatever cadence we're gonna need to keep up with them and make sure we're not a bottleneck in terms of what goes out to the other subcommittees. But um, for the time being, I agree. I think fewer longer meetings are more productive. Great, thank you. Um, so I, I agree with that. And I think um, the additional piece is that as we move towards breaking up into smaller groups to get some of the like sub pieces done, um, that might also help to advance some of the, the actual pulling together of everything. And my apologies, folks, but I need to drop off. It was nice to see everybody. Um, I am so sorry I'm going to be missing the, the pieces that are coming next, but I will look at the video and, and get back in touch with folks if I do have questions. So have a good rest of the week, everybody. See you soon. Hi, right, Leslie Ann. Thanks. Um, I, I, others on the timing and, and frequency? Um, Lou? Yeah, I agree. I think the, the longer meeting times seem like they'll be more productive. Uh, I echo Julie's comments that uh, 
you know, if, if there need to be responses in the meantime, you know, maybe that can be accomplished by email or, or by, you know, a uh, brief meeting between individuals um, who are, you know, uh, most, most closely connected to the topic at hand. But um, yeah, I think overall, the longer meeting times will be beneficial. Right. I agree. Great, thanks. And I'll take the thumbs up from Jared and Brian as a don't call on me, I agree, um, indication. So, um, okay, so I'll, I'll take that as, and then, I, I, sorry to be a little pedantic about this, but uh, ne so next meeting should be in two weeks and extend it uh, to from 1.30 to 4. Um, objections to that? Okay, hearing none, I uh, will we'll go with that. Uh, so thank you all for that. Um, I, I do have uh, on the agenda an item for any other council updates or anything in this space, although we're, we're running a couple minutes late, but we did start late. Um, but Jane, was there anything in miscellaneous or anything you wanted to share with the subcommittee before we um, get started? on the last agenda item. Uh, maybe just a one minute update on the technical analysis. Um, so just for everybody's benefit who isn't um, a subcommittee member and serving on the review committee, um, we the proposal did close last week, the RFP for the technical analyses. Um, we got four um, excellent proposals, um, any of which could do the analyses. Um, and we've selected a, a front runner um, but had some follow-up questions to ask of them around certain components of their proposal. So um, I reached back out to them yesterday um, and asked those questions of which they agreed by the end of this week um, to follow up with some answers and a, re a resulting revised scope of work and cost proposal. So our hope is that um, they'll be able to address um, the questions, concerns that we had, and we'll be able to move into a contractual negotiation phase starting next week. So really excited about the team that hopefully we'll be able to bring on board. And if for some reason it doesn't work out with them, um, our next best is really great too, as is really all of them. So it, it was a great pool to choose from. All of which could meet the timelines that we talked that we've now sort of set, um, which is also really great. And that's the only update I had, TJ. Great. Thank you, Jane. Um, Awesome. So with that, I uh, I want to turn it over to uh, Cara and Meredith or Jane. Do you want to introduce the topic, maybe? Sure. Um, thank you very much to all of you for providing space um, on your agenda to think about this. Um, so um, with Kara uh, and Meredith joining us today, they are two of sort of the three uh, critical pieces of the um, team that will help in ensure that we start um, down a thorough and complete path thinking about our public engagement as well as our communication strategies for this process. Um, Sarika could not be here with us today, um, but she represents RISE Consulting, who Tara and Meredith will speak to today as well. Um, so Tara and Meredith are both the uh, Director and Deputy Director of Climate Access. Um, we're really excited that they're now starting to reach out and into the other subcommittees to consider what um, your role will be in informing and helping to guide the public engagement process. Um, and I am excited that Karen Meredith will provide an overview of that if you weren't able to see it at the Climate Council meeting, but then we'll sort of focus in on this first phase of engagement that we're sort of right um, in, in right now with the planning process and hoping to sort of wrap up by the end of June to help inform strategies and recommendation developments coming out of the other subcommittees, as well as science and data to a, um, an, a lesser extent in some ways. So um, without further ado, I'll let Kara and Meredith sort of take over um, and look forward to a robust conversation with all of you about how to help guide this effort. Great, thanks Jane. And thanks uh, for having us join your subcommittee meeting today. It's nice to see all of you on the call. Uh, and um, we just we want to walk through overall our approach for the public engagement and communication effort. I know some of you have heard this already, but not everyone. So just want to bring everyone up to speed. But for the majority of the time, we really want to have a discussion and get your input. 
on the key stakeholders that we want to be engaging both in the subcommittee work that you're doing as well as the climate action plan as a whole so that's our our um what we're intending to cover today and so first before we go into uh activities and timeline just to give everyone a sense of the approach that we're taking with the effort uh, so really at the core is co-creation where we really want to make sure in the first phase we're developing the public engagement plan with the input of people across Vermont who really are connected to and have awareness of some of the key stakeholders that we want to make sure we're involving in this process to get their input on what is the best way uh, to do that. Um, and we want to working with um, the Climate Council, the, the team, but also the subcommittees, different uh, points along the way. Um, but we so what that looks like is at this first phase, getting your input on the stakeholders, as I just mentioned, um, that'll inform the public engagement plan that we're creating. Uh, we have two other touch points in the process to come back to you one is once we've gotten public input on the um just initial like where are we at what are we most concerned about what solutions uh are most appealing so that's actually pre-draft input from the vermont public and i just want to point out that that co-creation piece with the public is really about engaging stakeholders early in the process so that they're informing the plan versus responding to and commenting on a plan that doesn't have that public input so um but back to the subcommittee process we'll get your this is the point where we're getting your input on the public engagement plan once we've gotten that pre-draft input we'll come back to you with a summary of what we've heard and share that with you so it can inform the drafting um once the the draft is then out uh, we'll do another push to share it with the public to comment on that and that draft commenting will be rolled up and we'll come back and share that with you as well so that can inform the final report so those are some of the uh, co-creation pieces um, and then when it comes to just talking a little bit more about uh, the process with different stakeholders in the community as i mentioned we want to get people involved before there's a draft and that's really at a high level. So we don't have to have everything perfectly done. We just need to be able to engage people around uh, what are the climate impacts that they're most concerned about and their views on how it would impact them, um, as well as uh, with the range of solutions that are being considered for the climate action plan, what are their thoughts and ideas on that? What's missing? What, what should be prioritized, et cetera? Um, and then we want to again come back as i said when there is that draft uh to get comments again um so the, the benefit of this is that we're really going to be able to tap uh local knowledge uh, get to a level of understanding that's hard just to do with data um but also begin to create a, a foundation from the outset to gain buy-in and support for the plan itself the policies that will be uh, coming forth as a result of that, but also to really create a foundation so that stakeholders really are going to be key partners in the implementation. So if we do the front end well, then we'll ideally have you know pretty good momentum for people continuing to engage on the conversation. Uh, the co-creation is also really critical when it comes to equitable engagement. And this is a key aspect of our engagement strategy is really thinking about the stakeholders who absolutely we need their voice in this process, but who may be more challenging to engage uh, people who are disproportionately impacted by climate change. Uh, by energy poverty issues like that really considering that and making sure we're identifying those audiences and reaching out to organizations leaders people from those communities who can uh, give us guidance on how to do the public engagement and ideally partner with us throughout the process. So you'll see when we get to activities, there's some very particular things that we're doing around equity. 
Uh, one thing to note on that is that when we are asking um, those most impacted by climate change, those who have and continue to face systemic injustice, when we're asking them for their input, we have in our budget uh, offering stipends for that input so that there's a, a reciprocal nature of that engagement. Um, and then just another key point, we've we've gone back and forth with Jane on the timeline and, uh, you know, really happy that, you know, we're going to be able to go out with the draft in December and there can be further revisions because we really want to make sure there's there's time along the way for that input to take place. So um, one of the things we want to ensure so we can reach different stakeholders is that we're not just using one or two modes, but a whole variety of ways to engage storytelling, visual communications, uh, community events, dialogues, surveys, uh, online tools, social media. So there's a, a range of things we'll be looking at putting together in that public engagement plan. So um, I'm going to actually skip over just for the, the we just have some points there um, that and they can be shared in the deck about just going at the right pace. And that really is around that relationship building and making sure there's time for the listening and the exchange, uh, really, really key to the process. I just wanna make sure we have time to walk through things, but really spend the bulk of uh, the, the, the agenda on discussion. So in terms of some of the particular items, that first piece, as I mentioned, is um, developing the engagement plan getting that input from different leaders and individuals from different sectors, getting that input from you and the other subcommittees. Um, and then uh, summing up uh, what we learned from that. Um, and then moving to the next phase to develop a public engagement plan based on what we learned. Um, we'll be happy to share that draft with you and, and give you a chance to comment on it, add to it before it's finalized. Uh, a piece of that will be designing a social media campaign, uh, determining what is the set of uh, materials, collateral materials to support outreach that would be helpful. Uh, and then there'll be a launch of really announcing this is taking place. You know, Vermont wants to hear from, from you about this process and, and that uh, pre-draft uh, piece there. Um, what, part of that will be uh, creating and fielding an online survey, um, thinking about what the website needs to have on it in order to really focus uh, the public conversation, stakeholder conversations in the right way. Um, we'll move into some stakeholder dialogues, as I said, at that top level about what are people most concerned about with the risks, what are the solu different solutions that um, they're most interested in, supportive of, what are their thoughts on what's missing. And then, you know, I mentioned in the first, in the engagement uh, plan drafting that we'll be, we will be reaching out to different leaders, folks who are connected to the different stakeholder segments we want to reach. That's going to take place through a series of interviews, as well as two different roundtables. One um, that is specific to a BIPOC roundtable. Um, so once we've had this discussion with you and all of the other subcommittees, we'll put together a list of who we want to interview and include in those discussions and, and happy to share that out also for comment. But starting at that point, building the relationships with those organizations and leaders, we're going to want to return to them to say, OK, now we're ready to go out with the uh, public engagement. Can you share this with your network via email on your website, social media? Uh, would you be willing to partner with us to host a stakeholder dialogue that is tailored for the segment of uh, the public that you that you reach? Um, moving then into uh, the next phase, once we've gotten that pre-plan update, as I mentioned, we'll roll that up, we'll share that with you. And ideally that's woven in as another factor to consider in what's going into that draft plan. So obviously you've got the, the science and data piece, you have the work of the other subcommittees, all of the technical uh, information, et cetera, but then also considering of, of all of what you're looking at, where is their community support buy-in uh, interest? Um, then when there's the draft plan, 
to uh, announce that, push that out through an event, uh, promoting on social media via those partners again, asking them to share that draft out, uh, to, to engage with their networks, to get feedback on that. And then we're gonna have a piece that is a, an online deliberation and dialogue campaign when we have that draft where we lay out what's in it and really allow people to work through it, some of the trade-offs, weigh in on their opinion and, um, and vote on, on which, uh, which solutions they're most supportive of. So that will be rolled up, shared back with you uh, for any final changes on the plan. And then there's just a, a last piece of our work to do a push out of the final plan. Uh, and then we also do have an evaluation component at the very end. So before we move into discussion and just see uh, if anyone has any questions about the overall approach and activities. Okay, I'm not seeing any, but if you do have any questions, you can feel free to email Meredith or I and we could put our email addresses in the chat. Okay, great. So um, I do want to make sure we move into discussion. What we really would like to do is go through uh, a couple of questions. Um, and the first is uh, around the stakeholders that need to be involved in your subcommittee work and what needs to, what you hope that is gained from that engagement. Then we wanna move into a next question about the sectors, groups, communities, the different stakeholders that need to be engaged in the climate action plan as a whole from your perspective and why that's the case. Um, and then move into uh, when it comes to public stakeholders. So we're imagining there's probably a whole subset of experts that you need to talk to for your process that really won't be part of our effort. But when it comes to the public stakeholders, are there community, um, business, youth, equity, uh, indigenous, uh, local government or other leaders who you feel we should be reaching out to uh, in those interviews or roundtables I've mentioned to get their input on how the uh, engagement plan should be developed. So those are the questions that we have for you. And I think maybe we'll just um, kick off with the first one and then I'll, we'll go through them, I'll repeat the questions. Um, I'll turn to someone to answer. And then if that person wouldn't mind popcorning to someone else to take a turn to answer as well. I think that'd be a, a good way to go. So um, does that sound okay to everyone? Maybe thumbs up if we're good to go. All right. All right, so the first question again was, what stakeholders need to be involved in your subcommittee work and what do you hope to gain from that engagement? Uh, and maybe TJ, I'll turn it over to you first. I, I feel like the groups, that, uh, well, I was hoping you didn't pick me first, but uh, because I'm, I'm trying to parse what I might need for the comprehensive energy planning process with the climate action process. As everybody knows, we're also doing the energy plan here. Um, but um, really as this subcommittee, I, I, I feel like there's a whole lot of entities that um, either, it, I'll put it in two groups, either have data or are affected by how we use data. Um, and those that have data are kind of easier to get my head around in terms of um, uh, there are a lot of the stakeholders we work with often, but um, the ones that we don't are ones kind of in that might have data in either geographically or demographically diverse kind of subsets. And how do we draw them in to say, hey, we have information about this group that um, you know hasn't ever been considered before. And um, that's, I know that's kind of a vague answer, uh, but uh, I, I guess that's where, where my 
heads at. Um, the, the other set of stakeholders are, are folks that um, really want to contribute to um, what are the key questions that we need to answer as a, as a committee? What kind of data should we be collecting? Uh, and it's in, in my professional life, deal with uh, a lot of the same, same folks over and over. And so drawing in others, and I don't know who in a lot of instances they, they are that we're missing. I'll stop, I'll stop there. And um, since we're popcorning around, um, maybe I'll put, uh, I'll put Brian on the spot. Thanks, TJ. Uh, so I'll be a homer and um, put out that the Vermont Field Dealers Association should be one of those groups that we reach out to and particularly around um, uh, data. Uh, they being unregulated, there's not uh, as easy access to the data uh, of, of usage and, and those things that uh, we could probably obtain from that group. And I'll throw it over to Jared. Thanks, Brian. Um, building on TJ's framework of, of stakeholders that kind of provide uh, technical data or, or technical expertise versus those who are affected by it or maybe have more kind of a, a qualitative, um, you know, perspective on some of these issues. I mean, my starting point, given the work I do, is, is energy data and analysis. So I think of all of the stakeholders from, um, you know, utilities, both, um, uh, distribution and efficiency utilities, um, all of the uh, kind of weatherization providers and contractors who install energy systems, um, and then all of the folks who benefit from those programs, you know, folks who, um, you know, are recipients of programs like through our community action agencies um, across the state or through weatherization programs um, um, as well, uh, the, 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 especially the low-income weatherization programs. Um, as Brian said, uh, fuel dealers, I think um, transit agencies, vehicle dealers, um, you know, there's, we, we collect, collate, and then share lots of um, data and, and follow kind of the latest science on a lot of these things. I think the, the universities, um, especially ones that are doing, um, you know, research in this area, uh, UVM, Northern Vermont University, Vermont Law School, uh, Middlebury, on and on. Um, those are those are a few of the ones that immediately come to mind, but I'd also be happy to not take up too much time and keep writing things down and, and share them in a longer list and give other folks space. But those are some immediate um, examples that come to mind. You wanna pass it to someone else, Jared? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll pass it over to Julie. She's next on my screen. Uh, thank you. I had one thought, um, which is it, it gets at the monitoring and assessment work that ultimately this committee needs to engage in um, and really trying to understand from the public uh, what success is going to look like in their eyes. Uh, we have some very specific goals around greenhouse gas emissions reductions that um, in all likelihood aren't going to be apparent or tangible to people. Um, and then have uh, some sort of wider open uh, charges as, as a council around sequestration and adaptation um, and understanding from the public what success looks like in each of those spaces, I think will um, be very important in getting to the point you raised, Kara, about sort of the trade-offs and balancing as well um, between those activities. And I will turn it over to Lou. Thanks. I think uh, it's been a lot of ground covered here. I think uh, a lot of good groups noted. I think unsurprisingly, I, my first thought was uh, two electric utilities. Um, 
think getting the perspective of the distribution utilities in particular would be helpful as Jared covered. Um, so I think with, with that, I'll, I'll pass it over to Richard. Um, you know, here in Addison County, um, we're engaged in a, uh, a climate action plan planning process. And uh, we, we have wanted to uh, engage the community widely. I've, I've tried to use the analogy of something like a, a barn raising, you know, that, that we're going to build this structure, this uh, greenhouse gas reduction structure. And lots and lots of people in the community have something to add to, to that process. Um, you know, some people are good at roofing and some people are good at framing and some people are good at pouring footers. And, and if, they, if we all collaborate, we can get much more impact as a community than we can alone. And that's, in some ways that's kind of sophomoric, but, um, but I, it's, it, it's perhaps a useful analogy. So we've been trying to think about, particularly in this COVID era of, you know, who are the people who would never come to a community meeting about climate change? Um, but who need to be engaged if we're going to really have a community barn raising. And you know, at, one such group is, is underserved and underrepresented groups um, in our, both by race and ethnicity and by income level and by, ge and by geography. But the other, the other end of the spectrum is um, you know, people that, that manage multifamily apartment complexes, people that uh, sell uh, gasoline and diesel, people that sell fuel oil, people that sell cars, um, people that uh, repair, uh, H install and repair HVAC equipment and so on. And um, so we were actually, over the next uh, eight weeks or so, we're gonna be fanning out and each member of our core team is gonna interview one person a week uh, for eight weeks. So we're going to get about 75 interviews, we hope. And we're really trying hard to reach outside our echo chamber, outside our bubble. Uh, I, originally, I came up with a list of about 130 entities that we were going to try to involve. And that was too many by a factor of about two. So we needed to cut it down to 75 or so. But, but we're going to be ambitious about this. And we'll let you know what we find out and uh, who's easy to reach and who isn't. And who has interesting things to contribute? Uh, it's going to be an it's going to be an interesting journey. So that's what I had to say. Um, Brian, did you go yet? I did. Uh, yeah. Just sitting okay. here thinking and just reiterating what you said. I think the automobile industry really needs to be involved in this uh, at a high level just because they are key to uh, the transformation of the transportation sector. Yeah. I'm not, uh, sure, who, I'm not sure if there's anybody left who is a council, a subcommittee member who hasn't gone. Is, is there anyone who would like to add any comments before we go to the next question? Um, I, I just noted in the chat, and I'll, I'll say it for posterity, it's just municipalities and uh, um, energy committees, just local governments. And then um, I'll note somebody else put in the chat. Um, I don't see it anymore. I moved up, but uh, economic development associations regionally. Um, I think I'll, I'll stop there. Okay, one question I have, um, I saw in the materials for your subcommittee around data, you're also looking at climate impacts and how uh, it affects resilience in different ways, including resilience uh, of people. And, you know, I think those, this goes back to the first comments about the two categories of folks who have data or are affected by, and I think Eklu want to look at like, who is most affected by climate change um, and facing the most disproportional impacts from shifts with energy, et cetera, that we would want to consider their input 
uh, in this process. I have an initial question, Kara, if that's if that's okay, and it, it's it gets to a little bit of a tension that I'm feeling, and, and maybe it's just because I, I I haven't fully thought through or understood the proposal that that you shared. But it sounded like the the kind of in the initial phase, it's asking folks about the risks and impacts that they see with regard to climate change and climate impacts in in Vermont. Um, and then on the on the kind of later in the process, it's about feedback on the strategies and what you know resonates with them, what they like, what they have concerns about. And I guess I have a question on that first phase because one of the worries that I have is um, the extent to which we uh, kind of immobilize or disempower folks to think about things that we don't necessarily have a lot of control over in terms of, you know, Vermont's emissions are not going to change the, the global climate. Certainly we can respond in terms of resiliency strategies. Um, but if, if the second part of the strategy is really what do you like or not like about the strategies, I wonder if there is a question early on that focuses on not taking the status quo for granted. I think a lot of times folks are gonna say, what does change mean to me? And what are the costs of change? But I don't think we spend enough time talking about the costs of the status quo and the risks and burdens, especially of fossil fuel use that put on people. So I'll just give a couple of quick examples. The two highest costs, most price volatile ways to heat your home are with fuel oil and propane. And that presents a major energy burden for folks right now, the number of unweatherized homes in Vermont and the health impacts there. So I just wonder in that early stage, if there's a way to get folks uh, responding about the risks and harms of the status quo of the energy system, the fossil fueled energy system we have now that is creating lots of harm and lots of uh, health and economic damage to Vermonters in Vermont, rather than just taking that for, I'm not suggesting that's what you're doing, um, but I just don't want us to take that status quo for granted and assume that, um, and I, I guess it would be, so I think I've said enough there, but I just want to make sure we're teasing out folks understanding of how, what is causing the pollution is harming them already. Yeah. Yeah, and that really, I mean, I'm, I'm really glad you said that because that's the exact kind of input that we need to hear in order to figure out how to frame that discussion. But really it is looking at risk in, in different ways, right? And um, I've done it more on the adaptation side where you're looking at downscaled impacts and what it means for different people. And you are looking at it at the interface of uh, health issues which often does overlay with fossil fuels and who's bearing the burden of pollution there, et cetera. Um, so it's really interesting to me to hear you talk about it more on the, just on the energy side, the energy burden side. And I do think that energy burden and poverty access piece is really, really critical. And, and I do, so, but to, back to the main point is that that discussion around what's at risk and what concerns you most is we first have to lay out what's at risk to get people to respond to, right? And so that's where we can really address both the, the status quo of you know, emissions continuing as usual and what it will mean for impacts, but also what it means for the status quo and other aspects, yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so if there's no other comments now, uh, maybe we'll draw uh, back a little bit from the the subcommittee specifically um, and just look at the planning process as a whole. And when you think about both on the mitigation as well as the resilient side, like who really needs to be at the table. And I don't worry if this isn't like your ideas are not related to the expertise you have for the subcommittee you're sitting on just as a Vermonter, you know, someone who's in the know on these issues, just everyone's thoughts on, uh, yeah, stepping back from the committee a little bit 
uh, are there folks that haven't been brought up yet in the discussion that we should really be thinking about uh, making sure we're reaching as part of the process? So I'll, I'll start and um, I, I don't, um, you know, marginalized and, and under, under um, appreciated, underserved communities, we, we've talked about a lot. So I'm not, I don't wanna um, go there, but one kind of group or demographic that I feel like we don't talk about is our, our seniors and our aging population. And in that um, one, there's, there's a lot of aging in place issues, um, you know, in the state. And we have a very old, a much older demographic than a lot of other states. Folks wanna stay in place, but what does that mean in terms of health access, but also their access, their energy needs from driving where they are, or if it's, you know, nurses driving to them. Um, and then that just, again, plays into a lot of seniors are on a fixed income uh, as well. So, uh, and, you know, the volatility or high energy prices um, in the short term could really impact those, um, uh, those members of our community. Um, maybe disproportionately, I don't, I don't know. Um, but I just think, feel like that's a group we, we don't talk about much, but it's a really large population in Vermont. There's a, a piece that, uh, I, it took me a while to come to this, to realize that um, bankers and insurance agents are important players here. Um, and, uh, they're where you have to go to get the money to, uh, and some it, it, eventually to uh, be able to afford the improvements to your home or your business, and to ensure those uh, the, the the value that you've invested in. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with that, Richard, because the the upfront costs are the biggest barrier for folks to reduce their carbon footprint. And especially to TJ's point, the aging population don't necessarily, especially on a fixed income, don't have that kind of cash just laying around, whether it's a uh, banker's insurance or um, program specific um, individuals, we, we really need to tackle that barrier. What would be some entry ways into that community and, and what would the ask be in terms of engaging in the climate action planning process? In the, I can in tell the... you one thing just off the top of my head, you know, and it's been tried in various places, but having some sort of program where your monthly savings are being uh, uh, forwarded to your um, upfront debt. You know, that's uh, uh, zero um, um, cost upfront to the customer to make that switch. And having those discussions with bankers and with uh, program type folks to come up with something universal uh, for Vermont to have some sort of program like that uh, would be very beneficial. Okay, great. Um, Jared, thank you for your comment in the chat around intergenerational equity and engaging young Vermonters. Anyone else have any other ideas or comments on stakeholders to engage in the climate action planning process as a whole? Tara, okay. can I just put it Oh. oh, go ahead, Jared. I was just going to ask um, if it's possible maybe to see kind of um, the list that gets drafted based on these sessions um, at the um, end of it or as, as it exists once you've done that so that we can then read through it again to see if we feel like there are still some gaps that may have been 
still still need to be addressed. But I'm sure that um, there are other subcommittees who are going to think of stakeholders that that we have and have not. And I I wonder if there's a possibility to engage on the front end and on the the back end. Um, just I guess my brain is it, it helps me to look over a long list and have some time with it rather than feel like I've got to get it all at once on the spot in a meeting like this. So from these meetings, we're going to put together a spreadsheet that has all the different types of stakeholders that were mentioned. And if it was like specific to a subcommittee or if it was as a whole, and then to you know to to get our, to share that with everyone and then we want to look across that to really identify you know what are you know what stakeholders it's really like the work of the subcommittee to do that engagement it's really specific it won't be confusing in terms of outreach from other subcommittees or parts of the campaign and where do we need to make sure it's really coordinated so if we're seeing like you know three different subcommittees said the same groups of folks that they want to engage how do we make sure we have a coordination mechanism around that? So I think that's that's really gonna be important. We're, we're gonna be sharing uh, the spreadsheet with you. And then there's another piece, which is from that, uh, who do we want to, you know, your input on the folks that we should be doing the interviews with around the creation of the public engagement plan and the folks we should be inviting to the round table around the public engagement plan, the general one, or the um, BIPOC specific session. And so that'll be just another way to get your input on, you know, of all of these folks, like who would really give us the most insights on how to engage that stakeholder group most effectively. So that is our next step. And, um, you know, we just it got flagged, you know, fairly early on in our work that the coordination across the subcommittees is really critical. And from a public engagement standpoint, it can be really confusing for non-technical stakeholders to be hearing from, you know, different people in the process and not understand how it fits together or, you know, so we just want to make sure we're, we're coordinated and really doing that efficiently. And then also coordinating that in with the engagement work that is happening with the uh, comprehensive energy plan process. So we're thinking about how do those pieces fit together as well. Okay, great. So speaking of which, uh, we wanna move uh, just a little bit maybe deeper into the discussion. And I really appreciate that people are listing things in the chat, but thinking of, you know, are there specific organizations or individuals uh, connected to those different stakeholder groups that were mentioned that we should be putting on our list to think about engaging uh, in the process in, in one way or another. So uh, I'll just open that up to see if anyone has any additions to what's already been shared in our discussion, but also in the chat. Okay, well, as oh, much. Sorry, I, I just thought of one um, and that I'll put out here for this group um, because I had a specific ask about it for the energy plan uh, last week. And I, I've, I've already mentioned it to, um, to, to you, um, Kara, but uh, legislators are a group that um, really, at least the committees of jurisdiction kind of really want to be reached out to, but then they also, one benefit of that is they also have large kind of constituent groups that pay attention to their Facebook pages or whatever they have. And so just wanted to mention it here as well. You probably had it from our previous conversation, but throw it out there. Okay, great. Anybody else have any ideas they want to throw in? Okay, and I think probably when we share that spreadsheet to you, probably more things will come to mind as well. So, uh, okay, so um, I think we've really covered what we wanted to discuss. Uh, I can just 
go over the next steps, but I'll pause to see if anybody has any questions or comments before I do that. No? Okay. Uh, great. So as mentioned, so this week we are meeting with the different subcommittees and having a similar conversation. As I mentioned, we'll take all the notes and put together that spreadsheet that has the categories overall, uh, you know, folks, organizations within them, um, whether it's general or per a particular subcommittee. We'll also uh, share with you that list of who we were thinking based on that input would be good to interview and include in the round tables and get your input on that. We are trying to move ahead as quickly as possible because we wanna get all of the input uh, by the end of June. So when we're in the beginning of July, we're drafting the public engagement plan. Um, we'll share that with you as well so you can provide your input, but we ideally wanna start to kick things off in, um, in the summer. So. Uh, that's where we're at in terms of next steps. If anyone has any, you know, background documents or things that you think would be helpful, we have been reviewing, you know, subcommittee notes and just general, uh, you know, all the documents for the planning process. But if there's anything that you feel we should um, also be considering, feel free to, to send that to Meredith or I. Um, and I know Sarika will be on the other subcommittee uh, calls. We just had a few conflicts where her schedule didn't work for one and mine didn't for another. So we're, um, we're splitting it that way. But uh, for the most part, she will be part of these, the rest of these conversations. So any, if there's nothing else, maybe Jane, I'll turn it back to you. No, I just wanted to say thank you to both of you for joining us and then, of course, for making the time to join the other subcommittees this week. And I, I suspect there'll be no shortage of um, uh, communities, organizations, and folks that can identify for this process. So it'll be exciting to circle back and see how that's synthesized and put together um, for the in the spreadsheet that you spoke to earlier. So um, it looks like both Kara and Meredith have put their emails um, in the chat feel free to reach out to them directly. If you do, I would encourage you just to copy me just so I can keep in the loop on what's being asked of them through the contractual process. Um, but besides that, appreciate um, everybody making time and staying with the conversation after a long meeting today. So thanks. Thanks, TJ. All right. Thank you all. Um, yeah, that was that was really great. Um, much appreciated. And I realized <clears throat> before you closed, I probably should have um, invited those members of the public that are here to offer their suggestions as well. Um, but we do have an opportunity for that now. Um, so so please don't leave yet <laughs> um, and uh, invite members of the public. Um, if you have uh, comments on the outreach uh, strategy in general or, um, or ideas uh, for any of the questions that the subcommittee talked about um, to please chime in. And it looks like uh, Carl Bayer, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, I, I was wondering how more about, as I made comments, was wondering about how um, the public was gonna be actually engaged and actually have an impact. So I'll speak with two hats. I'm a rural Vermonter who is trying to age in place. And to do that, I have, to, I have been able to invest in a pellet furnace. And you already heard about the health benefits I mentioned before of being with a pellet furnace. Plus the fact that many people like me no longer can actually handle what we call traditional firewood, right? So for us to age in place, if we burn wood and we wanna stay away from propane and um, oil, uh, we need an alternative. And right now we think the alternative is advanced wood heat and I have a great system and I haven't had a bloody nose in two years. I also invested in solar, why? To keep my electric price down on a monthly basis. So at some point I can hope to get an electric vehicle. So the electrification of the state has that kind of implication and investment in solar is one way for the individual to handle aging in place. 
So that's that has to do with aging in place issues. Um, I am on the nine member and energy committee in Vermont. And you, need, you, you obviously know that our town plan, like many town plans, has an energy component to it. And the energy committee is the advocate group in town that promotes the energy plan of the town. That's a town plan officially voted on, supported by the regional. We also have an advisory group that speaks to us on the energy committee called Rygate and Climate Change. And our nine members are working on various projects that have to do with what we think is important, but may not after listening to the conversation today, decarbonization of Vermont. Now, how do we see decarbonization of Vermont? Since I heard people today talking about the fact that what we carbon in Vermont is not gonna affect the overall health of the, of the world. And I remember one of our legislatures said, there's nothing that Vermont should do because we're too little, too small. Well, we take a different point of view. We look 100, 150 years in advance. And I look at my grandchildren and my great grandchildren and I say, of course, what we do now is important, not just for us, not just for my children, but also for my grandchildren. And so that's where the sequestration comes in, the long term, long, more long term plans have to be part of our plan because we're not just living for ourselves, we're living for the people, people from the future. So as a member of the Energy Committee, working for the town on these projects, um, I think uh, that's the basis for a lot of your support for those that have energy committees. We are planning now to meet with the another town's planning commission, uh, uh, excuse me, energy committee. Two of the towns that are around me don't even have energy committees, but they do have town plans about energy through the planning commission. So I think that these units are pretty good where they exist to promote within the town. And how do we promote within the town? We have three social media platforms. We have our listserv, Rygate. We have a front porch forum, and there's a Rygate Facebook homepage. There's 500 people on it. Not me, but somebody else handles that. So there's a lot going on out in the community. It doesn't hit all the groups, but it certainly it, 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 it hits older people um, because we may have more time to go to the process because some of us are semi-retired or retired. And uh, there's a lot going on in, in the rural areas if there is an energy committee and you should tap into it. Thank you. Great, thank you, Carl. I appreciate that perspective. Um, Mark Whitworth. Yeah, thanks, TJ. I wasn't gonna say anything, but uh, Carl inspired me. And having uh, aged more than I thought I would in place, uh, <laughs> I too replaced my uh, cordwood boiler with a pellet boiler and I'm quite pleased with that. But uh, what I really wanted to say is that I'm on the, uh, the planning commission in my town, my Northeast Kingdom town of Newark. And I, we spend virtually all of our time, every meeting talking about climate change. We talk about, uh, and we spend most of our time talking about adaptation. How can we, uh, we, we occupy a very interesting place in a choke point of uh, the um, um, staying connected initiatives uh, linkage from the Worcester Mountains to uh, uh, into uh, New Hampshire. And uh, so we spend most of our time talking about how are we gonna protect that? What are the climate benefits of protecting it? Um, how is it, is it, are the uh, efforts that are underway to mitigate climate change going to interfere with our ability to uh, enhance our resilience? And that's something that we're concerned about. And uh, we spend almost uh, most of our, uh, every meeting that we have, most of our time is spent on that. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, I think um, as as the comments have come in in the chat, I don't I don't know exactly know how they're preserved, but there's been a lot of um, comment about municipalities, town level, energy committee level engagement uh, as being um, really important. Um, 
Um, so I think that uh, message is being heard. So I, I don't see any other hands up. Um, looks like there's no further public comment. Um, so with that, I think we have our next meeting scheduled for two weeks from now, from 1.30 to 4. We'll send out an agenda um, in advance, hopefully more than uh, a day in advance this time. Thank you all. Um, thanks to um, Climate Access for the great presentation and uh, facilitation of a great discussion. And, um, and to the subcommittee members and, and to the public for uh, you know, sticking through this long, long meeting and uh, your great input. And with that, uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.